Hello and welcome to the BFI at Home event. My name is Kieran Yates and I'm a journalist and broadcaster who's absolutely thrilled to be joined by two activists and campaigners this evening to discuss the seminal film, Who Polices the Police? Now, there have been 1,700 deaths in police custody in the UK since 1991. And these are some of the themes that are dealt with in Who Polices the Police? A look at police brutality, past and present. I'm joined by Ken Farrow, who is a community activist, campaigner, member of collective migrant media, and also a filmmaker behind other films such as Tasting Freedom, which deals with issues such as detention, and also Who Polices the Police, with a focus on police brutality. Marsha Rigg is a frontline worker for Black Lives, particularly lives affected by police brutality and deaths in police custody, something that she knows keenly after the death of her brother, Sean Rigg, in Brixton Police Station in 2008. She's an activist, a campaigner, and this conversation this evening will discuss what we can learn from past and present instances of activism. Ken and Marja, it's my absolute pleasure to have you here this evening. Thank you for joining us in conversation. Now, for both of you, of course, we're in a, a current moment where this film feels even more important for a generation who is seeing it for the first time. And I know that the BFI have been showing it all weekend for people who might be new to it. So how does it feel for you both? Have you rewatched it? And how does it feel knowing that it's still as prescient in 2020 as it was when you made it? Yes, I've rewatched it, actually, just to refresh my memory, going back um, 12 years. Mm. Um, <laughs> Um, and nothing's changed, really. When, when, when you look at all the compelling evidence and then what, um, what happened in the end, after the, it was reopened as a criminal investigation, they then followed reviews and the officers were interviewed again. Uh, evidence was um, reconstructed. Uh, we had judicial reviews. We had a perjury trial. We had the gross misconduct hearing. And still... Uh, the officers walked uh, walked free. But from the very beginning, the evidence was there. And the jury in 2012 at uh, the inquest found that the officers' actions or inactions more than minimally contributed to Sean's death, which is basically, in my, to my mind, an unlawful killing verdict. Had they been given that um, option by the coroner, um, where the coroner did not allow unlawful killing or neglect as a verdict and only gave what was a narrative verdict. And it's not a criminal jurisdiction, so the jury couldn't attribute, couldn't attribute any criminality to any of the actions or the evidence that they saw. Mm -hmm. But they could use the words more than minimally contributed to his death. And I think in the, the jury's very damning narrative verdict, it says it three or Three on, on three or four occasions that their actions at that particular moment in the sequence of events leading up to his death um, contributed to his death. That's an unlawful killing. Ken, for you, I mean, rewatch, I mean, I rewatched the film as well. And I think despite all the density of the language of the state, when you see it, you still feel that emotional raw frustration and mm. you still understand that we're, we're in a moment where there needs pushback. How does that feel for you rewatching it in the current context? Well, I have to admit, I didn't rewatch it and I can't rewatch any of the films that I've made. Um, I find it really pretty traumatic uh, and I'm actually completely sick of watching them after I've done because the way that migrant media works is uh, we work over a long period with groups of people. I'm talking about five years, seven years. So that for me, there's no need to rewatch it because I've actually lived it with the families. Um, of course, I want other people to watch it and to feel what you have just kind of described, which is that raw emotion and the anger, uh, and hopefully uh, a kind of feeling that they should do something and can do something. And I think that's why we make the films we do, to motivate change and, and encourage people to take action rather than um, look at it in the way the state looks at it. Uh, and you mentioned language and, and some of the language Marcy was using is uh, restrictive it, it does come from the state there's a kind of soft language that's around even now uh, in terms of the issue today you know there's a, a hashtag going around saying the uk is not innocent for me that's absolutely ridiculous the hashtag should be the uk is guilty and i think these kind of shifts in language are really important in terms of uh, people understanding the issue 
the public understanding the issue, who don't know all the details. Uh, we have to get that message across, and I think the film is, it helps to do that in, in some way. When you talk about the language of the state, what were the things in the making for both of you? Because I, you know, I guess when you're going through this process, you learn more as, as it goes on. What were the things that were the most egregious for you, the things that you just, you couldn't believe was being used against you in that way? Well, I, I just couldn't believe that the, the so-called investigators couldn't see what we could see in the footage, the, the truth. It, you know, laid out bare on camera and on audio for all to see and the witness evidence, the medical evidence, mm. it is there, but it is interpreted by the pe very people that should be there to, um, to give us justice when there is evidently wrongdoing. Um, interpret it um, in, in a completely opposite manner. Implo <coughs> Sorry, interpret it in a completely implausible manner. Mm -hmm. um, getting rid of evidence. And that's what I find extraordinary, that they still do that. Um, because I've met so many other families since Sean died. And... It, it, it's, it's ludicrous. I mean, we see the death of George Floyd and everybody saw that on camera. And, but that was, that, that was nothing new. It's just that the whole world saw what families like mine have been going through before Sean died and after Sean died today. Could you tell me a little bit about the, the, your process of collaboration? Because I think you make a good point about how now films like this are just evidence as to why it's so important to ar archive these moments, to mm. archive these moments of injustice that live beyond, you know, hashtags or, you know, or the current moment of rage. Sure. How, how did that happen, you know, for you, Ken, when you were sort of watching these events unfold, how did you reach out and how did that process begin for you both? Um, well, Migrant Media uh, set itself up in the early, in 1991 actually, as a collective, working collectively, a group of people from um, black and migrant backgrounds who uh, were interested in telling stories from our communities, by our communities. Uh, and for us, um, the oppression from the state was something that we felt and everybody within migrant media comes from either Caribbean, Africa or Middle East or migrant backgrounds. And we all had our different experiences. But what we shared was we realized that we were being exploited as a community in terms of the narrative the state would want to go. The most liberal elements of the state, and I'm talking about broadcast media, would look at these stories as stories of victims. Uh, and for us, it wasn't just this notion of victimology. There was the resistance and the fight back that was always there and that was never shown. The fight back against injustices, the fight back against racism, the fight back against exploitation, against uh, uh, the repression of refugees was never really shown. And that's what migrant media has done for the past 30 years. And I think so this film fits in, in, in within that kind of pattern. Uh, in terms of our working method... Um, we work in a kind of process journalism over very long periods of time, four, five, six, seven years, with groups of people. Uh, we are not bourgeois filmmakers that kind of impose our own views um, on people. Uh, we're there to act as a weapon, basically, for people within our community. And, and, and I think that's, that's quite a, an important um, heritage that um, UK kind of documentary filmmaking has. And you think about Chedo and Black Audio Film Collective, and, uh, you know, many collectives that work not just around race, but class and gender. It's all there. It's all part of our history. And that history of resistance, as you mentioned, that history of struggle and that history of, of filmmaking is becoming really popular now with young people. There's, you know, a lot of young people who are completely and utterly uh, fed up with the older generation's liberal kind of responses to all these issues. Um, so I think it's, it's a film of the moment. Um, it was a film of the moment in 2012. And it will be a, the film of the moment um, in, you know, in 20 or 30 years time when people are still struggling for, for justice. Marsha, for you, you know, was, was there a level of hesitation of working with a filmmaker? How did you, you know, how did you trust Ken? How did you know that he wasn't going to uh, be, <laughs> be an arm of the state to exploit the story? Because Ken allowed us to tell the truth. <laughs> Ken was working with uh, some other families. I met Ken. Um, when I attended um, the United Families and Friends um, Memorial March in 2008, in October. 
I, I met the sister of Brian Douglas, um, Brenda Weinberg, um, who's the co-founder along with Ken of the United Families and Friends campaign. And I was invited to the march and I could not believe that there were so many other families that had suffered the same fate. But I was new. We were, we were new to this. I mean, Sean died in August and it was October. So that's like three, three months. And um, the, as a family that was investigating it ourselves, we knew so much at that time and we knew something was desperately wrong. And I saw the film Injustice mm. and the families spoke from their heart. And I remember um, my mom and my sister and myself, we sat and watched it and I cried the whole way through because it was so touching. It was real. It was believable. And, and Ken has followed our, our campaign ever, ever since. And, and we were doing Who Polices the Police over a number of years. Um, before the uh, before the inquest, and so but but the evidence of the inquest came out on the first of August, and and um, Ken um, very carefully and strategically, we all agreed that we was going to put our investigation out on the same day um, as the jury verdict on the first of August, and it was powerful and it was in stark contrast. I mean, it agreed with the inquest's um, findings. And it was in stark contrast of what the officers had said. So we were correct. And Ken gave the true story, whereas sometimes like the BBC or, you know, um, the general media itself will not show, uh, hear the family's voice. The family has to speak and that's the most powerful. And Ken gives every family the opportunity to do that. And that's what's important. I have to say one of the things that's most extraordinary watching it as a viewer now is that it feels like it's a real product of organisation and mobilisation and, you know, a real engagement with how are we going to come together to confront the police. And so some of the most striking images are, you know, walking into Brixton Police Station is, you know, being part of that, of gathering. Could you, Ken, for you, do you, could you make a film like this now? And what is the kind of level of organising that you had to do within uh, Marsha and extended community to make this happen? Mm. Um, yes, films like this can be made now. And I'd encourage young people, you know, young filmmakers to, to make these kind of films and to keep making them. I mean, it takes a commitment because it's about being involved with the activism, um, and being involved with the campaign and strategically moving forward so that the, the film production goes together with the family campaign and they come together you know, at, at um, crucial points. Uh, and of course, as a filmmaker, um, I don't believe in objectivity. Um, we're completely and utterly subjective. Uh, and many people criticise not just this film, but Injustice for being, uh, for, for not being objective. And my answer to that is always, well, you've had, you know, um, 20, 30, 40, 50 years of the police point of view. So actually 98 minutes is unbalanced. You're right. It's very unbalanced, you know, in terms of the families. And so with that in mind, what we try and do in terms of migrant media is that we, we uh, get involved and bring our own experiences and the experiences of other campaigns and other struggles we've been involved with around deportation, around um, police brutality. There's a connectivity. People talk about intersectionality. There's a strong intersectionality in terms of resistance, in terms of campaigning and in terms of learning lessons of what's done before. Uh, and this is not just local, it's international as well. So all of this feeds into a very complex process of deciding what to call things, what to do things. You know, when we made injustice, we call them human rights abuses. That was the first time deaths in police custody, which is, again, a very soft language for police murder or, or police killings, you know. And so um, it's a collaborative process. Uh, and it's uh, it's very different from conventional documentaries where, you know, you would arrange to do an interview and then do some f um, film some stuff and, and then put something together where you just really what you're doing there is you're, you're pre-writing the story and then you're filling the gaps in and you, you're presenting the point of view you have on paper. For us, it's a much more organic um, development where you see what happens, you influence what happens and then you record it. And in the end, it turns into something. You know, you don't know where it's going to go, but sometimes the best journeys are the ones where you don't know where you're going. I think we can't have this conversation um, 
right now without talking about abolition or talking about a lot of the conversations that are happening right now about reimagining the police state. Now, I know that these are, are hardly new ideas and I know that both of you have, <laughs> have heard these ideas throughout the last 20, 30 years and beyond, but what are your thoughts on how these ideas are taking shape for a new generation? So I would say in terms of the young people today, Okay, I remember um, when we were filming Injustice and um, one of the people who was involved with Injustice was Hurlington Armstrong, who was part of the Black Panther Party in the UK and worked with Dark as Howie and Race Today. And I remember when we were planning Injustice, we were just sitting around talking about, well, what can we do, um, you know, to like push us forward? And it was his idea to say, why don't you march on Downing Street? Um, and we said, well, where did that idea come from? And he said, well, the IRA did it. Um, they marched to Downing Street with coffins of people that had been killed uh, and who had died, um, Bobby, Bobby Sands and the Mays. And, and so that, that history of resistance that was in him and in the Race Today collective then was passed through to our film. And that's what we've been doing kind of ever since. And so I would say to young people, please learn that history of struggle because it is there. And they are learning it. I know they're learning it. Uh, and, you know, some people have been criticising um, young people for... Uh, being to not having the knowledge. I don't think we can accuse young people of not having the knowledge. We haven't taught them in schools. If we don't talk, teach them in universities, if the history of racism, the history of resistance to racism isn't part of the curriculum for every person, every young person, then it's no surprise that they know little about it. So I, I can quite understand why they will jump at the George Floyd murder and because they're reacting to it uh, and, uh, and, and, it, and it impacts them deeply. And for them not to know about the cases in this country, it's not their fault. So I think we have to give those, those stories over. And I think um, another thing that's important is that um, always be careful where the direction of the struggle is going and who's leading that struggle. Because there will always be forces and, uh, and individuals who will uh, move it away from a more radical point of view. I remember um, in Bristol when the statue was taken off um, and thrown into the into the sea. Uh, Sky News called me up and they said, well, have you got any comment about the statue being thrown in the sea? And I said, no, I haven't got any comment about that. But if they throw a police officer in the sea, call me up. And obviously, I never got that phone call. So I think this is the kind of position we need to be taken because, you know, we really have to be careful about the soft language and about the teaching in schools, it's very important we learn about colonialism, it's very important that everything that's being pushed for, that you mentioned, um, Kieran, does come through. But it's not enough. These people have been killed by the police. We have evidence which is unrefutable that they are guilty of crimes of murder in some cases, manslaughter in others. And if all the evidence is there, then we have to keep pushing for these cases to be reopened. It's not simply about drawing a line and saying, OK, this is terrible, these people have died, but now we're going to learn the lessons. It's been going on for two, three hundred years, uh, and it's not going to stop unless there's a, a change in this country. And also, you know, you know, when we're talking about defunding the police, we don't necessarily exactly mean that there should be no police officers on the street. You know, what we need is, is community centres. You know, where are all our community centres that the younger generation, my generation in the 80s mm. and, and the 70s, we had somewhere to go, something to do, something that we could learn from each other. You know, you could, you could go and go to college, you could go to university, it was free. These are the things that we need to, the community to see. So, for, for instance, policemen have no right to be involved with restraining somebody that's in a mental health crisis um, to death, to the point of death, where the government and the Home Office sees that as not excessive. For instance, in my brother's case, it was found um, that he was restrained for a period of seven minutes the jury found it was eight minutes it was reconstructed and they reduced it to seven minutes seven minutes is still too long mm -hmm. you know the prime minister is talking about uh, and and keir starmer they're talking about black lives matter and george floyd and that they um completely understand the issue that he was restrained in that position but so was sean so was so many others you know that i could real a list of, of names and i hope that you'll be able to 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 see the patterns in the way that people have died but they are not acknowledging like ken said what's happening in the uk seven minutes was found to be not excessive in sean's restraint in the prone position which is face down in grants 
with excessive force being applied where there was medical evidence to show the deep bruising, there was photographic evidence, there was witness evidence and so forth. All the officers had to say is, well, we did turn him on his side at some point. They're the only people that said that. Well, I don't care if they turned him on his side because they, if they did turn him on his side, why is he dead? Why should somebody be allowed, a police officer be allowed to restrain somebody for seven minutes to the point of death and it is not deemed as excessive? So what we also need to defund is the officer's mindsets because somebody should know that if you restrain somebody for X amount of minutes in a certain particular way that they could die. and A member of the public will go to prison for that. Uh, and so we need to defund their mindsets. One thing um, that I, I always think about, and I think for myself and my peers, I think we would certainly say that thanks to the work that you've done, you've definitely opened up new conversations about everything from state-funded legal aid to disproportionate number of deaths in police custody and you know the use of the disproportionate use of restraint on young black men in particular in the UK. And I think that, you know, a lot of the time with campaigners such as yourself, you know, there is, you know, there's this kind of this energy, which is which is fantastic for myself and my peers for sure. But, you know, we also know that activist fatigue, activist burnout, all of this kind of slump when you come up against these challenges are also part of the experience of being a campaigner and activist. So, you know, what else do you look to to kind of get you through? What keeps you going other than the obvious pursuit of justice? You know, what can we take from that? What can we learn from how you have continued and you continue now? Well, that, that's a really good question, actually. And it was a question that I asked Angela Davis personally as well, myself. Basically, you have to balance it. I was given this job to do, as far as I can see, and I, at the time, I knew nothing about deaths in custody. I just knew that something was not right. I knew that there, um, I knew that I had rights, and that my brother had rights, and that he wasn't able to speak for himself, and so that I would be his voice. Mm -hmm. And I'd seen the evidence myself. And, and I was angry, and the anger gives you the passion um, to, to fight on, to show the truth. But also, it, there is a price that one pays for that, and that is your well-being. Um, to be focused on something as so prominent and, and in, a, in a strong media campaign in the way that I've managed to do it, um, from the perspective of everybody out there, they don't see um, the insides, they don't see when I come home and close my door, when I'm left with the, the injustice and the death of my brother, perpetually. And then meeting other families. But when you meet other families, because the whole point of doing this is that you don't want it to happen to another family. You don't want it to happen to somebody else. You, you crave for justice because it's evident that um, there, there's wrongdoing neglect, murder, manslaughter, um, health and safety, so much things come into play. Um, but yet we are, we are blocked by um, the very system that, that's there that doesn't afford us justice or accountability. And that's, you know, if you stop, that means they've won. It will go on forever. And we cannot do this for our future generations. Mm -hmm. We cannot do it. We have to what we're doing now, Who Pleases the Police, Injustice, and all the other films that Ken's made, and all the other documentaries, and Black Lives Matter. It, it's just everywhere. We're not saying this for no particular reason. There's a reason for it. And we have to hang on to hope. Mm. Um, there is no justice. There's just us. But we cannot live, we cannot live like this forever, and that's what keeps you, you going until my work is done when when i'm left this earth my work is will not be finished until then until then my work is done in the meantime i have to try to take care of my family and my well-being because um life still goes on and where families like myself are not afforded um grievance in counseling we're not afforded um compensation we get nothing and so families are traumatised 
on con uh, you know indefinitely we are traumatized and for that reason um, people like me have to to keep fighting for justice but also i feel like this those failures of state care make it ever important for us to define care in our activist communities. So things like the small things of buying shopping, of, you know, topping up Oyster cards, of, you know, driving you, suddenly all of these kind of networks become so important. And so I'm, I'm just interested to ask for both Ken and yourself, what were, those, what were those little things that really kept you going? What are those things that are often kind of um, underappreciated that have really enabled you to continue the work? Black, Black Lives Matter did something for me really, really important uh, re recently. Black Lives Matter UK, shortly after the death of George Floyd. And obviously I was being inundated with calls from journalists and so forth. But one thing that they did do is that they sent me food, lunch and dinner via Deliveroo um, for, for at least a week. Because one thing I wasn't doing was I wasn't eating. That was the best thing that anybody could do for me because it gave me fuel and energy to, to do that important work that I had to do at that time which was zoom meeting after zoom meeting interview after interview you know and, and all of these things and I wasn't eating um, I thank Black Lives Matter again for that is something that's so important um, and I remember that very well so and that's something just really simple just ordinary everyday things to to relax your mind mm -hmm. because the anxiety and the trauma is perpetuated every time you see a new death what about for you ken was it a kind of on deck grabbing a zoom grabbing a boom <laughs> grabbing anything for you no no not at all i mean the two things back to the back to your original question was when you were talking about um in terms of the young people and certainly in terms of what keeps us going in migrant media we're completely aware of the victories uh, of the struggles that have happened in this country over the past 30, 40, 50 years. If you look at um, the case of the Mangrove Nine, and um, Steve McQueen's just put out a new film, or will be soon, uh, around that particular case, that was a case where uh, a group of black people uh, went into court and proved that the police officers were lying. And that was the first time in this country that was a general acceptance that police officers are capable of lying. Uh, if you move forward to the case of the Bradford 12, when a group of uh, 12 young Asians in, in Bradford armed themselves because the National Front fascists were marching through their streets and the police were doing nothing about it. They made um, petrol bombs. Uh, they were accused of terrorism. And an all-white jury found those 12 young Asian men not guilty. And they established the right of self-defense in this country for every single person in this country. We have a right of self-defense when you're again getting attacked, whether it's by a fascist uh, in or out of a uniform. With the Stephen Lawrence case, the case of racism within the police was established, although we knew it already beforehand. So if you look at all these improvements in terms of the perception of what the police do and capable of, you can see there have been victories along the way. And so the, in terms of deaths in police custody, human rights abuses were... Um, Criminals who are paid by the state, paid through our taxes, have committed crimes and have not been found guilty, have not been taken to court for them, will be exposed. It's just a matter of time. And so that's why young people have to keep going. They have to take on where we've left off. And in terms of, I mean, there have been so many moments where people have come up after the showings of the film and offered support and become involved and decided to do things. I mean, I can give you a thousand different um, stories I won't because we don't have time. But really what I would say is that the power of film to move people is immense. And there have been so many screenings all over the world. Uh, and I've had uh, old ladies in blue rinses coming up. I've had revolutionaries coming up. I've had judges coming up. And all of them say we have to do something about it. And I think that what heart that's what heartens up. When you do something where you're not supposed to do, nobody wants to fund it. Nobody wants to see it. And when it's made, they try to suppress it. And yet it still gets through because people, when they hear the truth and they, when, when they see something, they naturally feel it's the right thing to do. And I think that's what keeps us going. The fact that the, uh, you can't hide the truth forever. I completely agree with that, Ken, because it really takes a, a human story to, to change a human heart. And, 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 and these um, deaths are you know, immoral and they really need to, to be seen. One thing the government doesn't like is embarrassment 
You're right about celebrating those achievements because often the dominant narrative is ostensibly that you lose, that, mm. you know, we, we have lost the war, that these battles aren't worth fighting. And you're right. And I think that, you know, new technologies have been very helpful in spreading those stories of, um, of success. Of course, uh, people like Stephanie Lightfoot Bennett with United Friends and Family campaign have used Facebook to a really, to, to a, a really, um, I guess, inspiring way in terms of really showing on an online community how big this is, how many people are experiencing the same thing. Uh, and I think certainly social media often gets a bad rap, but it has been quite good for educating a new generation. What are you kind of what are your thoughts on that? Do you hear that when you speak to younger people? Do you hear they're being sort of mobilized and engaged in that way? And how how involved are you in social media in that way? I'm very much involved in um, social media on Facebook and um, Twitter and I have been, I've run a very s successful campaign um, on social media. So social media platform is very important and there's been a lot of interaction with um, younger and older generations worldwide. And so um, social media is very much a platform that is um, that has made a big, massive difference. And that's why we know about the death of George Floyd worldwide. And, 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 and the protest, you know, the issue of the hashtag Black Lives Matter movement has also um, raised the issue. So, um, so we must keep the momentum going. It's very important that we do that. I think um, looking at the past, if you look at the 1960s in America, when we had the Black Panther Party who were challenging the racism of the state. Uh, we had the Vietnam War on. Um, we had um, the movement for uh, liberation of Africa from colonialism and imperialism. This is the heritage that young people have today. And I think the issue really in terms of social media, and it's very useful in this way, is that it does raise consciousness. It does raise consciousness, and it's very, very powerful at doing that. The transition between raising consciousness and collective action is where we're at today. And I think it's a really crucial historical period. And I'm actually very hopeful um, in terms of young people, much more than I would have been 10 or 15 years ago. So these moments that we find actually are created through forces that are just, you know, spontaneous. It just happens to be about the right people at the right time. And I think it's very important that young people today don't lose hope and do understand that there have been victories and if people hadn't marched the situation would be worse uh, we know that from history so i would just say that it's a very important that uh, the young people who are active today are still active in five years and 10 years and 20 years time you really have to follow this journey when we started you know 30 years ago we had no idea where we were going we had no idea how long these things would take you just have to be um, slightly stubborn and uh very very angry and not lose that anger and the person i mentioned before hurlington armstrong uh, after the brian douglas case brian douglas was hit on the head with a baton with uh, the amount of force of uh, falling down 13 floors and he died uh, through the blow from the police officer nothing's been happened with uh, nothing ha nothing's happened with that case after the inquest when there was a verdict of misadventure um, despite three qcs who said it should have been murder manslaughter uh, despite uh, uh, Lord Justice Butler's inquiry into the Brian Douglas death, despite all of that, the reporter from the BBC asked the family, what would you say to the young people in Brixton who are angry about this? What the reporter was really saying was that, can you say to these young people, please don't riot? That was the subtext of this soft language. And what Hurlington said, which was very, very powerful, he said, to, he said, what I would say to those young people is stay angry. Stay angry and do something about it. And I think that's a very powerful message. Just to go back a little bit, um, what are some of the, the archives uh, for you, Ken Farrow? I know that you've uh, previously mentioned films like The Hour of the Furnaces that look at Latin American resistance and revolution. But yeah. what are some of the things that we should, we should look back on and explore? Um, there's a whole range of films. Some of them are in the BFI archives um, from the Middle East, from Latin America, from Africa, 
from every other country and from Europe. The third cinema movement is incredibly important. There's a whole history of the most amazing, beautiful, powerful films that are out there, and you can't see them unless you look for them. So please look for them. What are some of your favourites? Well, give us. My give f- us- I can't. <laughs> <laughs> give us a starting point Ken. give you i would uh, look at look, okay look at third cinema look at the workshop movement look at the work of, of black audio film collective look at the work of chantal ackerman look at the work of goddard look at the word of uh, simbani look at the world of yusuf shaheen you of leila Khaled. you know i can go on and on and on just don't look at channel four don't look at the bbc yeah and don't go to the multiplexes unless it's run by the bfi of course yeah Um, because there's a whole history out there. You have to just go out and find it. It's not that difficult. It just takes a bit of effort. And the the repayment you'll get in your soul, in your heart, is massive. So just go for it. What about for you, Marsha? Is there any reading or is there um, any things from the archives that have been particularly powerful for you? It basically confirmed what my personal experience by seeing the, the archives and learning about the cases myself because I had to become an expert. If, yes. if I'm talking in universities to the younger generation or I'm giving a public speech or even giving evidence in Parliament, I have to, I have to know the history. Yes. And so I spent a lot of time learning. It. This was all new to me, you know. So mm-hmm. I've had to spend a lot of time learning it. And also, um, you know, I found it very important that I archive the evidence as well. And yes. so... Um, meeting with other families, other families having the opportunities to tell their stories. And, and, and the media did start to, to, to show an interest, some people like Channel 4 and Channel 5 and BBC. And, and, and so the deaths have been, you see the deaths have been more highlighted on, 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 on the news, mm. the more high profile ones. There are lots of others that mm. uh, people don't know about, but this was something that never used to happen um, often before. And um, so, yeah, it's very important to have the archives. But right now, the, um, the system is so is so. Um, there's never been any accountability, and they've they've just become complacent. Mm. And there were so many families that that didn't know about it. I mean, each family are independent of each of, of the other. The families are independent. Mm. but the, the the system the iopc the police and the other stakeholders are not independent mm. you know, i mean it's ironic when you when you look at it they say that they're independent and but they you know from the evidence that i've seen and from my experience they're, they're colluding together and the, the families are the ones that are independent yeah and and then they, they're now starting to come together and, and and noticing the patterns and their own experiences this is very powerful collectively we can, we can make a big difference and there is hope. Yes, because watching the film, I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's a physical, it's a physical activity. It's like you're watching failure after failure. You're watching, you know, uh, police officers give you these answers that don't make any sense. You're reading tr- court transcripts. You're listening to, you know, lawyers who are telling you facts versus the reality on screen and I was just watching it and I've seen it before but again you're just like how how can this happen and I think probably that's not the most useful reaction the most useful response is to say this is how it is this is how it has been and this is how we can police ourselves or not I mean do the action of policing the police ourselves via community what are the, I mean, we're moving forward. What are the things that you are, are taking forward? What, you know, what can you arm us with when you're watching a film like that with the things that you have learnt? We're talking about policing. I think a lot of people are seeing the IOPC as some, not a place that helps them. Uh, what, what can we do? What can we do? I think um, from my point of view, you know, we, when we made Injustice, uh, we had the Police Complaints Authority the families coming together and organizing and taking control of their own struggle. And the important thing with, um, with that organization was that it was led by the women. It was a group of black women that were leading a national campaign, uh, the mothers, the sisters, uh, and through their struggle and through the making of the film, which went hand in hand, there was a change in the system. Yeah, there, there was a change in the Crown Prosecution Service. We did have the 
the head of the CPS resign. Um, there was an inquiry by Lord Butler into Shijia Lupiti's case and some of the other cases. And so there was progress. We had the IPCC was formed, yeah, as a result of that. And of course, who polices the police went back to ask the question, well, has it made any difference? And the clear answer is no, it hasn't made any difference. And so that's why we made the film. And in, if you're talking now about the IOPC, you can see that these are just changes in letters. There's been no change in political will. There's been no change in terms of how the state uh, handles it. It's just become very adept in terms of managing. It's become very adept in terms of um, controlling. Yeah. Um, but people have to just bear in mind that, um, you know, um, progress does come through struggle and does come through resistance. Uh, and uh, we can't be uh, people of the, of the moment. We're talking about a movement and a movement has a history and it has a future. So we have to know about that history and we have to know about that future. I completely agree with, with Ken. I, I wouldn't take anything away from what he, he's just actually said. Um, we really do have to uh, move as the movement. And as we go along, we, you know, the right paths will, will be open and, and we'll, we'll just have to keep going and see what yeah. does really make effective change. And, and this is the thing. I mean, a lot, of, a lot of my position is, you know, is one of deep gratitude for black resistance, who is, which has come before me and which has allowed us the language in which to speak back to the state. But it's, it must be so difficult when you have these kind of ideological ideas of destroying and rebuilding everything again, while also having to work alongside these structures. And you can, you can think both things, can't you? And yeah, well, you know, at the end of the day, there just needs to be a political will to do it, and they don't care because they haven't done it. Yes. We have, we've had over, you know, about over fifty reports over the decades in this country on the issues of racism and, you know, deaths in custody and, and the police and so forth. And there's been numerous recommendations, repetitive recommendations, they're not being implemented. You know, every couple of years we have another review going over the exact same thing, it's just different cases. Um, and so they don't care. That's what the evidence shows. And they, they, have, they, have not, they have not made a difference. It just needs to be a political will. And this can change. Okay, so to sign off, um, what, what are some of the places, where are the places that you can direct people who want to be more involved in direct action? Where can they donate? What are come of a couple of things that we can boost? Um, well, they can follow Migrant Media on Instagram um, and find out what other things are going on in terms of not just these films, but the, the other films we're working on. Um, and of course, they can support um, families through the um, National uh, Memorial Family Fund, which is run by um, the, the family of Mikey Powell, who was killed in Birmingham. Uh, uh, in 2003 um, and so they're the two main um, areas of support really in terms of people we want them to support the family campaigns financially we want them to be aware of what's happening through the work of migrant media and of course we want people to join the families and support them in the, the marches that they have in the protests that they have there's always something going on um, you just have to access the information through forward ever um, they always have a daily kind of upbeat, um, sorry, update um, for whatever, always have a day, uh, an update of what's going on. People can get organized and get active and talk to the families, find the families. It's not that difficult. Yes, you can also get hold of families um, um, through the United Families and Friends campaign and the charity um, inquest that works with families. Um, but uh, on social media, there's, there's a lot of inter information, Institute of Race Relations. Um, check out my uh, Facebook page, um, Marcia Rigg, and, and there's a lot of information out there. Um, and so educate yourselves, keep angry, and let's keep up the struggle for the fight for equal rights and justice. Uh, usually uh, at the, uh, the last Saturday of October, um, families gather um, as a memorial in remembrance of our loved ones um, who have died at the heads of the state uh, from all different ethnic backgrounds. And so on Saturday the 31st of October, people are invited to Trafalgar Square 
and to Peter the walk to down the street where you will hear um, stories of loved ones whose um, loved ones have died at the hands of the state. Uh, and so come along and support the families as well. Marjorie and Ken, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for discussing the film. Uh, thank you for making it and thank you for still being so active and having so much energy, which is being passed on and used, hopefully, moving forward. Thanks, thank Karen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Throughout September, African Odysseys are screening a series of films under the banner Injustice, so please do check those out too. Thank you so much for being with us and thank you for watching. <laughs>